So my aim is to first of all make these guys feel good about what they're doing. And and that is the prime, that is the first thing that must happen. I would love to spread happiness through my food. And and that's that's the ultimate goal. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Australia's culinary landscape is dotted with periods of time that directly correlate with migration patterns. Italian and Turkish migrants in the 50s and 60s, Vietnamese in the 90s, to name a few. In recent years, migration from India has boomed. Will that result in a boom of Indian diners across the country? But of course, there have been some flying the culinary flag for India for decades, setting a benchmark and delivering dining excellence down under. Ajoy Joshi is a chef and owner of Nilgiri's in Sydney. Ajoy, how are you? Excellent. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show. You've um, been at the helm of one of the best Indian restaurants in Australia for a couple of decades now. What's it been like for you being sort of right at the top of the, the pointy end of the Indian dining spectrum in Australia? Um, well, I don't know if it's the top end or not, uh, Anthony, but I just do what I've been doing for years. And <laughs> at the moment, it keeps going up and down like a, like a yo-yo. So, um, yeah, I mean, to answer the point, uh, the, the question is, I, I just believe that I, I need to showcase my, if, if you want to call it art, and the best possible way to do that was to uh, do it through my food. And I've been doing that for about in Australia for about thirty one years now and uh and about forty one in all. I started on the first of December uh nineteen eighty nineteen seventy nine. Wow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> before we take the deep dive into you know what you have delivered in Australia, take us back to India. Uh, what was food like for you as a kid in your family? Okay, my family was a very, uh, let's put it this way, middle class family. Dad was uh, in the defense; he was a scientist, but worked for the for the defense uh, organization. Mum was a um, uh, a teacher; she was a, um, a primary school teacher, and uh, what they called uh, forget the phrase now. Um, uh, anyway, whatever. She was an English teacher. That's all I can say. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we came from a very average family I had uh, three brothers and sisters and uh, all of them were or are now professionals and uh, um, growing up was pretty much uh, having average or good food but nothing fancy uh, once in every couple of months dad would uh, you know as a reward take us out to a restaurant which was then called a hotel hotel was the right phrase in India Hyderabad where I was growing up so he would take everybody which was a big family of six uh, to a restaurant, uh, and then that was it. And um, yeah, and life went on. Um, so to me, dining is is uh, or dining out was always uh, a very unusual and uh, a, a beautiful experience, mind you, because we would look forward to going out for dinner with mom and dad every three months or so. And dad had to plan it, mom had to save the money, and you know it's like a typical average family. And uh, yeah, as I said, my mom was actually a Montessori teacher. That was a phrase I was looking for. Um, yeah, and and uh, she was very keen that uh, you know her children did well at school and studied, and uh, education was a top priority. So going out was more of a reward for doing well at school. To put it across uh, in, in simple words, um, yeah. And then um, yeah, time came when. Um, all my sisters and brothers decided to become doctors and engineers. And um, it was kind of taken for granted that I would also either join the armed forces or, uh, or, or become a, one of the, uh, you know, join the uh, professional industries or professional fields. Uh, my interest was, to be honest, playing cricket. And Anthony, that's an absolute <laughs> fact. <laughs> Ask any Indian kid and he'll tell you today, that this is the first thing that he wants to do, and it has not changed for the past probably 50 years, right? So <laughs> when I said to my dad, Dad, I'm doing all right. I'm doing pretty good at cricket. He said, all right, keep going, son. But think about it. He said, uh, you know, there's only 11 who can play for the country. And if you can be one of the 11, well, 
I'll give up my job tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, son, you can be, uh, uh, there could be a 1.1 million army officers. There could be a million and a half doctors and engineers. Why don't you think of it? And I thought about it and I said, I'm not going through this grind, you know, doing the seven, eight years of medicine and then five or seven years of engineering. That was not for me. So he said, well, if that's not what you want to do, do, you know, do whatever you think you can. So I, I was in a, in a, in a dilemma. It, it, it sort of didn't click to me that there was anything other than cricket, medicine and engineering in life then. <laughs> so it just happened that I met this friend of mine and um, he belonged to a very elite family from Hyderabad. Now, mind you, Hyderabad was uh, till about late 80s, um, a, a, a place where uh, the royalty met the common people. So Hyderabad had people from the old Nizam family and then the, there were the, the, the common people who lived in Hyderabad. And uh, the only common element that was binding was the food. And um, this friend of mine said, uh, my sister's getting married. Would you like to come over for a reception? And uh, terms like reception and, uh, you know, eating out, dining out, other than going with my family was unheard of. I had never been to this kind of a uh, function. So I took one of my friends and we went there and uh, I was absolutely blown away with the uh, spread that was laid out. And mind you, Hyderabad, which was uh, an independent principality. We were never ruled by the British. It was, we were actually a part of uh, the Nizam's uh, colony. And, um, and when, 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 of course, India became independent and uh, Hyderabad joined the Indian Republic and we became a part of India, things were pretty much the same everywhere. But there were certain pockets where you could see old, you know, uh, remnants of the Nizam. And this was one of the occasions. The weddings in Hyderabad were all white. Everything was silver. There was no gold. And the food was amazing. It, it just, I, I could not believe that I had seen anything like this. I could see anything like this in my life. And um, I saw this old man. And when I say old, he was, he was really old. He was sitting down and he was slicing onions in his hand. There was no cutting board. There was absolutely nothing. The knife was flexible. So you can imagine a blade, literally a slice, a, a thin blade. He was slicing onions and they were coming out absolutely perfect. Then he would slice them. He would then chop them. Everything, you know, you can imagine French as they call brunoise and they, you know, all those terms. I had never heard of them before, mind you until I saw this guy and then I went on to do my, my apprenticeship and all that. But this guy actually was, and I can, I can visualize this sitting down talking to you, that, that old man, we call, they ended up calling him Ustad. The word is U-S-T-A-A-D, meaning a master. That, that's a term they use in Hyderabad. And Ustad was probably a fourth or fifth generation uh, uh, cook in his family. And they've, been cooking for, you know, five generations and they cook for the royalty in Hyderabad and they cook for the common man. So he knew both sides of the, the coin. He could cook for anybody, literally. But watching him actually slice his onions, I said, this is fascinating. I'd never seen anybody, including my mother, never seen anyone do that because cutting was always on a board, on a cutting board. This guy had nothing. He was sitting on, on, a, on a bench and... Um, you know, slicing onions. And I said to my friend, this is fascinating. I'm going to forget the wedding. I'm going to watch this man cook. <laughs> and <laughs> he said, no, but you're here as my guest. I said, yeah, I understand. But I think this is more interesting than, don't get me wrong, but this is more fascinating than the wedding because I can always come in and have the food when the, when the nikah or the wedding is done. He said, you're, you're being rude. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm being myself. You know, I, I just, <laughs> but anyway, this happened. And then I saw him do something, which was again, I had never seen this before in my life. He cooked a slice of meat, what they call a piccata, on a hot stone. This was not metal. This is stone. And the stone was sitting on live embers. This is Hyderabad 1978-79 I'm talking about. I saw this and I said to myself, wow, what in the world is this? And get closer. And that stone was sizzling. You can imagine the slice of meat cooked on that on that on that hot stone and then served into those 
put it in the chefing dishes and then it goes into the buffet. I asked somebody over there who could speak a little bit of English, what exactly was he doing? He said he is actually he, uh, cooking a fillet of meat. And I'd never seen this before. I was always uh, of the impression that meat was cooked on, uh, on metal and this was on stone. That, that again fascinated me. And, and the whole experience, and I, I'm, as I said, it's live in front of me. I, I can see it happening here. I went back home and I was dazed. Dad said to me, is everything all right? I said, well, yeah, I think I found my profession, Dad. So <laughs> he said, all right, tell me, spill it out. <laughs> so I said to Dad, I said, you sure you want me to do this? Do you want to sit down and uh, get a glass of, uh, you know, he was an army man, get a glass of rum and uh, soda and ice and whatever. He said, no, tell me, tell me now. So I told him, I said, Dad, I want to become a, a cook. You can imagine the reaction. <laughs> he, 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 he almost fainted. He sat down and said, can I just get a glass of water? Get mom over, please. I need to talk to her. <laughs> so this happened. And finally, mom, you know, mom, she was probably five, ten years ahead of all of us, even in those days. And she said to my dad, if this is what brings him happiness, it is going to bring us happiness. So he said, but what about others? What are they going to say? She said, you don't live for others. You live for your, your son, your family. Finally, it dawned upon him that he had to do or give in to what his son wanted to do. So I eventually, on the 1st of December, 1979, I went back to this guy and I said, I really want to learn how to cook. And we were, we were four of us. So this was my first day of apprenticeship. And this was, he was actually contracted to a hotel. So I joined the hotel as an apprentice, uh, as an apprentice, worked with him for about a couple of weeks and um, weeks became a couple of, a few months. And then I thought to myself, I spoke to the chefs in the hotel. This was a four and a half, five star property. And they said, if you are really keen and if you want to pursue this as a career, there are places where you can actually do your apprenticeships. That's what, that's when it all, you know, started. I went to Chennai and started my uh, my actual training in Madras those days, it, that, that's what it was called. So, yeah, it, it's been a journey of about 40 odd years. So, <laughs> and it's been fascinating. It's been amazing. And, and this guy, I, I used to come back to Hyderabad every year and a half, two years and uh, try and, you know, meet up with him. And the first thing he would say is, have you got my medicine? And medicine was nothing but a, a quarter bottle of rum. That was his medicine. So, <laughs> I had to give it to him for him to you know, have a conversation. And we used to have a wonderful time. And he, his life was, it, 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 it was kitchen. It started off in kitchen and he ended up in the kitchen. And mind you, I was told years later, he passed away in 85 or 87, something like that, that he actually died on the job. And I, I don't think he would have been he, disappointed at all. In fact, he would have been the happiest man. And, and I think to die, or to pass away or to, to, you know, leave the world and go to a new world where you want, you know, where you've lived all your life would have been the best reward for him, for all his, his time spent in the kitchen. So, you know, this is, this is life. And I, I think about it and I say, if at all I have to do this and if I have to, you know, kick the, kick the bucket, uh, where would it be? And uh, hopefully in the kitchen and what will happen, I, I've told my son and my staff, just make sure you spread those ashes on Barossa Valley if you can. <laughs> well, hopefully that ha doesn't happen anytime soon. But uh, the, the food of India is so different depending where you are in India. Oh, tell us about the, the food from, from that sort of South Central India region that you're from. Okay. Um, Anthony, so this, when, I, when I started cooking and I, I traveled around and uh, people ask me, what do you, where are you from and what do you do? And I said, I'm from India and I, I cook Indian food. And they say, oh, you cook curries. And I said to myself, never heard of this phrase before. I mean, I come from Hyderabad where every dish had a name. It's just like you are called Anthony, I'm called Ajoy. Somebody else is called, you know, Andrew or so on and so forth. Every dish had a name. The last thing I'd ever heard of was a dish called a curry. So I ended up asking people, what in the world is a curry? He said, well, yeah, when you put a bit of this and a bit of that and, uh, you know, bit all the, put all the spices together and it's got a heat in it and it's got chili in it, it becomes a curry. And I said, how, you know, how fascinating that you can, all you can think of is a bit of chili and a bit of spice and, and, and the heat. And I said, this is not what Indian food is. 
Indian food is much more than that. And mind you, it is only in the, in the and this is an honest, mind you, opinion that I have. It was only in the Anglo-Saxon world that Indian food is called a curry. India, mind you, is 30, at least 30 to 32 countries put together, Anthony, where the only binding factor, don't get me wrong, is cricket. And then comes the food. <laughs> the only religion is cricket and food. And food, to me, is not about curries. It's about each religion, each, each region, not religion, each region showcasing what it grows and what it brings out in terms of spices and herbs and all that. That is what food is in India. You travel from Hyderabad and you go to the neighboring state of, uh, let's say, Karnataka or Bangalore, the, 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 the cuisine changes completely. The fabric of the, the whole, the, the, you know, that, that cuisine is completely different to what you get in Hyderabad. So when you, in fact, when you travel, let's say, from Sydney to Melbourne, there's hardly anything that changes. You might see a few wineries, but the rest of it doesn't change much. In India, traveling from one place to the other, one state to another, you will see how different each cuisine is. And I thought to myself, how fascinating, how, how, how do I tell the rest of the world that this ain't no curry, guys? This is this is a cuisine. This is food that has so much of uh, uh, you know life in it. So much of uh, uh, there's this uh, what we say uh, in Hyderabad. There's a lot of fursat and mohabbat in it. Fursat as in leisure, mohabbat as in love. In all this food that is being made, and it, this ain't no curry, guys. This is not about a bit of this and a bit of that. Indian food is a process-driven cuisine where every layer has to be cooked before the second, the third, and the fourth layer goes. And that, to me, is such a fascinating aspect of Indian food, which today, mind you, I'm in a country, in a place like Australia, where people have traveled to India today. People have been to the inner pockets of India, mind you, not just Delhi, Mumbai, and, and all these um, you know, cosmopolitan cities, but they have traveled to little-known regions like Madurai, like Chetina district, and, and they have seen food which is, is fascinating. They come back and tell me, Ajoy, I was in this place. Can you try and recreate something like that? So can you imagine how, 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 how you know, where we are today and where we were about 30 years ago? It was all a curry. Not anymore. Things have changed. People have traveled and they know what Indian food is, how those spices are blended together, what it means to put a bit of, uh, uh, you know, a bit of coconut oil or whether it's mustard oil or it's sesame oil or is it mustard? You know, all these mediums of cooking change from region to region. And what is the influence of that on the ultimate or the final product? So fascinating. And this, you know, this is the best part that people are willing to listen and people are willing to try. That makes my job easy and difficult at the same time because I have to then live up to the expectations, if you know what I mean. So this is where we are, Anthony. And uh, yeah, what is, what? I mean, I can go on, to be honest. <laughs> you mentioned how different it was 30 years ago to now, but it yes. was about 30 years ago that you came to Australia. What, what led to that move? Oh, um, back to cricket. Anthony. <laughs> I said to my dad, I said, I've, I've been in this industry in India for about 10 years and I really want to travel. So he said, okay, can cook, will travel, go on. So he thought I was going to go cooking around the world. I said, the first place I'm coming to is Australia because I had all, for all these years, my ambition was to, you know, meet up Don Bradman. Don't get me wrong. This is true. This is real. Okay. And we were three of us sitting in Hyderabad on that little lane. Uh, and, and every evening, myself and these two guys would meet up and say, one fine day, we are going to be in, in Australia and we will see the dawn. You won't believe this. We would listen to ABC commentary with those broken little, uh, you know, transistors, as they call them. We would hear Australia play England, the Ashes. We would hear Australia West Indies and, you know, Tony Cozier and... Uh, uh, the voice of ABC, I forget his name. I would hear this. And I said to these two guys, I said, one fine day, guys, I'm going to be in Australia listening to these guys live. And I'm going to see the dawn. Now, mind you, one of them is in England. The other fellow is in America. I'm here. But I, when I came to Australia, I called up these guys and said, I am here. You won't believe this. And then they said, we will join you someday. I said, I'm here only on a visit. I'm not so sure if this is going to work out. This was 1988. And in, Australia was in the midst of its bicentenary, mind you. And, and Australia needed good chefs. Australia needed 
I was a good chef. So probably they needed chefs. And and I happened to be here at the right time, the right place. And I got this offer and I stayed in Brisbane and I stayed on. And I, I'm here now, 30 years down the line. So, you know, uh, well, I, thanks to cricket and thanks to Mr. Uh, Don Bradman. Mind you, I never got to, saw him, uh, to, got to see him in life in person. The closest was uh, a television in my house when I saw this interview of uh, Don Bradman, uh, uh, Sachin Tendulkar and Shane Vaughan. I don't know if you remember this. This was going back. 96 or something. But I that was the closest I ever saw and I ever got to saw Don. See Don, you know. So, but then, thank you. But yeah, moving on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still cooking. <laughs> still loving my cricket. So, yeah. <laughs> well, well, long before uh, Neil Geary's, uh, you, you opened up other restaurants in Australia. Well, what was it like in that time when you opened Malabar in, in Crow's Nest and, and sort of introducing Indian cuisine into Australia at that time? It was a challenge. Uh, as I said, Anthony, everything had to be a curry. And uh, that was the first thing myself and Mira, my wife, who is my partner in business and, and was then as well, uh, we decided that Indian food is anything but a curry. That's the first thing I've, I've always said to my staff and, and I keep telling them. Because the moment you say curry, you are actually, actually you know, uh, boxing the cuisine, putting it in a square box, a cuisine that's been evolving for the past 5,000 years. This is, uh, you're doing injustice to yourself. You stop learning because making a curry is formula food. Indian food is not a formula. Indian food, food needs to be understood from the, from the ground level upwards. And I said, for that to happen, we need to travel to different regions of India. So we started Malabar. And Malabar is a region in India which is on the southwest coast. And I said to my partner then, I said, I'm going to do Malabar food the way I know it. And the way I knew it then meant there was not ever going to be a tandoori oven. So my partner said to me, Ajoy, if you do not have a tandoori oven, we will go broke. I said, I said to my partner, I said, well, we have started with nothing. There's really nothing much can happen. We can't go any further down, you know. <laughs> I said, give it a try. Let's start off and see if people accept it. The first reaction was of, you know, what? You don't have a tandoori oven? You don't do tandoori chicken? But as time passed and we, was, we started doing food from that region, people accepted the fact that India is a little bit more than, you know, tandoori food. And then it was a matter of, it was, it was for us to start showcasing and trying to, you know, make people a part of our journey. We took them around. From Malabar, we went to Goa to, you know, we went to Mumbai and then went to Rajasthan to Kashmir and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do. Every three months, I, I change my menu. So, you know, people get a taste through my eyes and through my hands what I perceive to be food from that region. Because it's it's very it's a dangerous phrase when it comes to Indian food to use the word authentic because authentic could mean there's 1.3 billion of us and there, there are 1.3 billion versions of authentic food. <laughs> you know that's how it is because each one is authentic because that's the way my mom cooks that's the way my grandmother cooks. So I try not to use that phrase, but I said this is my interpretation of food from that region. Mind you, people like it, people accept it. They don't like it, they tell me. It's 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 as simple as that. So, yeah, it was a challenge then, but the challenge has now become more of a, uh, a fun journey. It, it, it's a, you know, it's a part of a journey that's been going on. Well, the, well, the journey that you've taken diners on at Nilgiri's for the last two decades has been extraordinary. How did it begin? Okay. Um, well, I have tried my best to connect the name of my restaurant to something that happens or has happened to Australia or to the country. And mind you, Malabar, as we know, there is a region called Malabar in, 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 in Sydney. Uh, may not be known for its, you know, whatever reasons and uh, whatever. But Malabar in India is the southwest coast of India, which is also the Spice Coast. And so I've, I've tried to do that. Then when we decided to move on and start another restaurant, Mira and I thought, what should we call this? And one of the things that came to mind was a, a region that I've really loved and worked in India is a is a place called the Nilgiris district, southwest of, of Bangalore, on the, on the way to Kerala. A little pocket, little region, which is called Mudumalai and Nilgiris district, uh, where a lot of coffee and tea plantations take place, a lot of herbs are grown. And the funny thing is that these people actually drink coffee but export tea. They don't drink tea. 
but they grow both. They, they grow both, tea and coffee, both. But coffee is consumed, tea is exported. And the biggest consumer is uh, Lipton's because the Lipton tea comes from that region. Anyway, that's a bit later. But I, I said to me, I said, I love that region. I've worked there for a couple of years and I want to use that. We did our research and found out that Nilgir is the word literally means blue mountains. Yes, and there's a connection between Nilgiri's district and Blue Mountains in Australia. The British actually planted gum trees from Nilgiri's district in India and put them into Blue Mountains in Australia. Oh, sorry, it's the other way. Uh, the other way, sorry. They, they took them from Blue Mountains of Australia and planted them in, in the Nilgiri's district in India. And that's how the connection is. So I said, here we go. We've got a story going, you know. So the, 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 the word Nilgiri's was, again, something to connect with Australia. And then I started a re restaurant called Telecherry, which was uh, a, a project that I did for about five years and it was a victim of COVID. Unfortunately, I had to stop it. Uh, we had to close it down. And um, Telecherry again has a bit of connection to Australia because there's a ship that traveled, I think from Ireland on its way to, uh, to, to India on its, and it, it took a detour and came to Melbourne. The ship was called Telecherry in 1821 or something like that and had about 1,400 convicts or something. I forget the exact story, but it actually, the ship sank off the coast of Melbourne or something. And, and I think about 15, 20 people survived. And the, 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 the replica and the remnants of the ship are somewhere in Melbourne and some of them are in Kerala as well. So that's how every, I, I think it's important to have a connection. You know, then there's a bit of story you can tell. One of the things that you've been doing over the last couple of decades as well is is the cooking studio and classes and that connection with your with your diners. Um, tell us a bit about that and 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 um, what you garnered from that. Well, Anthony, it had to happen because when people started coming to my restaurant and every three months or I, I have a ninety five percent regular clientele that comes in because they know every three months they will get to eat something different. Um, but there's always that client, that, that clientele or that customer who says, I ate this dish three months ago or six months ago. Can I get that again? Or will you teach me how to cook it? So when that started, when that, those, those questions were, were, were put across, the we, uh, well, cooking classes were a byproduct of it. They had to happen. And um, initially we started doing demonstration classes where people would sit across in closeness and watch me cook and then they would eat and take down notes and things like that. It reached a point where people said, I've seen enough for joy. I really want to cook it with my hands. So come, you know, come, I think, uh, St. Leonard's, uh, bigger studio, bigger restaurant. And we had to then start off with the um, hands-on cooking classes. They've been fantastic. People love them because it's an experience. You know, it, it's not just about mixing of the spices and grinding of them. It's the entire process of making the dish from start to finish. Because you are actually going through a journey within that that three hours, you're actually taking a journey from start to finish, the whole process of adding the the cooking medium, which could be either mustard oil or coconut oil or sesame oil or ghee or whatever it is, and then adding the spices, then the onions, and then the next. And then, and then when you see the entire dish, you know, take uh, unfold in front of your eyes, you, you, you can actually, you know, the smells, the, the flavors, it, it just is amazing. And, and, you know, a lot of times people come expecting a dish, but they say, we have come here expecting to learn one dish, but we have learned and understood how Indian food is actually, it, it happens, you know, literally. So they, they, have, they have understood what it means to cook Indian, not just a dish, but the cuisine. So, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's amazing. And, and uh, we had to take a break during COVID. But, um, yeah, we decided uh, people are, you know, most people are operating from home or working from home and they want the downtime. They want to do some cooking. Videos are good, but nothing better than coming to a cooking class and going back and recreating it in your own environment, in your own little space. And uh, yeah, we started again, um, I think 2020, mid 2020, we started again. Um, instead of, mind you, we, we were doing about 75, 80 classes in, in St. Leonard's. I can't do that many anymore because of the restrictions, but I do about 25, 30 classes a year. And each class has, got, has its own theme, uh, belongs to a certain part of India. There's, uh, the idea is to try and take you to that region through the food and try and talk about a little bit of the history and the culture without getting 
you know, too deep into it because at the end of the day, it is a cooking class. So, yeah. Yeah. A few years ago, you um, moved site to Cremorne. Uh, yes. And you also took the opportunity to sort of evolve your own cooking in a way. Tell us about the, the transition there and the, and the change in your cooking that, that happened. Okay. Um, when we were in St. Leonard's and Crow's Nest, I was trying to, you know, go to a region, study that food, then come back to Sydney or, you know, take down notes and come back to my restaurant and recreate it exactly the way it was um, in that place in India. It was good, mind you, it worked. But there was a time when I felt I could actually put my little, you know, experience of working in Australia, working with different spices and, and, and technology and all of that, and see if I can evolve a style which is mine without compromising. And mind you, every dish that I cook in the restaurant goes through a, a stringent test at home. I've got a son and wife. They said, Dad, you are a chef at, in the restaurant. Over here, you're just a glorified dishwasher, you know? So, Dad, yeah, don't get too excited. Don't, you know, don't wear that tall, big hat of yours. Just cook and let us decide whether this dish will actually, you know, is, is acceptable or not. So I go through this at home and there's a lot of flack given to me uh, because my son, he has his own views. Mira has her own views. And yes, I do club the two views and I then create my own. But I try and understand what they're saying. My son was born here. So he has, uh, he has a good idea about what people in Australia like. And Mira has a traditional views from India. And the two together, I need to blend, which has really created this style of mine, which is in between, you know, the uh, so-called traditional Indian and the Australian. But it is what it is. It is mine, you know, and, and, uh, and people eat it. My wife still eats it. My son eats it. So I think I'm probably doing it right. And, and, and that's, that was the reason why when we moved to, uh, to, to Cremon, uh, Mira and uh, Anirud said to me that it's about time you started doing things a little differently. So when they said differently, I understood exactly what they meant, you know, without compromising on the taste and, and the ultimate product. So here I decided that instead of going through that whole process of, you know, um, I'm not saying not grinding the spices. I still grind my spices, but I do it in a manner where I'm able to extract the best without consuming time, if you know what I mean. Indian food is very time consuming and, and, and people don't really pay me for or you know, pay the kind of money that they should for the time I spend this. They, they give me or they pay me for what they see on the on the table, on the plate. And if I get that right, you know, which means I don't have to, lamb, lamb in this country is beautiful. Goat in this country is beautiful, which means I need to cook it according to the produce of this country. You know, I, I can't be cooking my lamb and goat for about four hours. There'd be nothing left because meat in this country is fed for the table. There's a completely different protein in Australia and and. and and in India, India, you have to go through a different process. Same with the fish. Fish is so beautiful and so fresh in Australia that I don't really need to do much. In India, you have to wash the fish. Then you have to apply turmeric so that it stays fresh and so on and so forth. That's also got to do with the environment. You know, you, 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 to preserve the, the, the freshness of the fish, it, this has to be done in India. Whereas in Australia, I get my fish every day. My supplier brings me fish every day. Why do I then need to do all this that I was doing it in India? You know? So these were the things that we changed when we came to, to Cremon. And I'm really happy because the menus, as always, keeps changing. A few things have changed. And I'm, I'm, I must say, I'm, I'm happy with the result because it has never compromised on the ultimate product. Mm. You've been part of the evolution of uh, the culinary landscape in Australia for a couple of decades. Um, where, where do you see Indian cuisine in, in Australia at the moment? Okay. The answer to that lies not only with me as, as, a, as a professional cook, but it is also with the customers. It is also with the people. You see, if I, if I get encouragement, if I'm encouraged to cook, what I cook, then I will cook more. But if people come back to me and say, I really don't think I'm, I want this. I want the, you know, I want the butter chickens and chicken tikka masalas and I want, you know, then as a business, I, I do have to give in. So if you understand what I'm saying, it's a two-way traffic. People need to appreciate what I'm doing and, and I then have to raise my game every time. So where do I see it going? Well, if there are people, and I'm very lucky, mind you, 
and, 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 and I need, need to accept the fact and acknowledge that. I'm extremely lucky. But how about the other restaurants? Are they being encouraged to do regional Indian food? Are they being encouraged to showcase food from a certain pocket of India? If people say, all right, you've been doing Punjabi food, why don't you showcase Punjabi food from a certain region of Punjab, let's say Patiala? How about Amritsar? Because within a state, there are certain pockets that have their own cuisine. And if people come and ask me, then I, then the onus is on me. So, yes, I would love to see Indian food, you know, go the way, I won't say Italian is gone because it's, it's hard to do that, but it can certainly go a further, a further than what it has because instead of just being Indian, it could be Hyderabad food or it could be food from Chennai, or it could be food from Chittinad. And mind you, this is happening in England and even in America. It's hard to say that because Americans are very very rigid in, in terms of what they like and don't. England has started to showcase that. You will see food in England which is from certain pockets of, of India, certain smaller regions, unknown or lesser known regions of India, the Northeast, which is what we call the Nagaland, Assam, and all those places. There's so much of food, Anthony, over there that to say that Indian food is just butter chicken, chicken tikka masala and rogan josh is, is a, is a, it's a shame. It's, it's, you know, we are missing out on such a beautiful cuisine. So, yes, I would like Indian food to go regional. I would like Indian food to go ethnic, a lot more ethnic than it is today. And be honest again, I have to perform, but I need audience. I need people. And, and that's a challenge. I, I try and do that because in my takeaway, I try and do things that are popular because when you look at a takeaway menu, you want to see something familiar. I don't want to lose that client. There is, a, there is a market for that. So I must keep that market. But when you come to my restaurant, you are in my domain. You know, you are in my place. Why don't you eat what I have? And people accept it. You know, so that's an encouraging uh, sign for me. I hope this, this trend continues. Because there's a lot of chefs who are coming into the country and who would like to showcase their style of cooking, which is from that region of India. So, yeah, hopefully it happens. You've opened so many people's eyes to the depth and breadth of Indian cuisine and brought so much joy to so many people over the decades. But what do you love about what you do? Anthony, my philosophy is very simple. If I don't enjoy it, I don't do it. And I don't do it to please anybody. I, I have to please myself first. Because if I'm not happy, there's no way will it reflect in my food. And that's exactly what I tell my staff. I said, if you're not feeling happy, don't do it. Because, you're, you're, you know, the, the mind is so powerful that it, it'll, it'll take over your hands. So my aim is to try and make, first of all, make these guys feel good about what they're doing. And, and that is the prime. That is the first thing that must happen. I would love to you know, um, how do I put this? Spread happiness through my food. And, and that's, that's the ultimate goal. Um, my chefs, my staff, most of them understand. Some find it hard to accept it, but that's okay. You know, <laughs> life goes on. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joy, it's been an absolute honor to have you on Deep in the Weeds to hear a bit of your story. And just just out of interest, what, what sort of cricketer were you? A, a batsman, a bowler? Do you have uh, some stats you can give us? Okay, between you and me, Anthony, I could have been a bloody good Sachin Tendulkar, man. <laughs> 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 no, I'm just kidding. I was I was average. I was below average. In fact, I was nothing. <laughs> but then, when I was growing up, I thought I'm the best, you know. I thought I, I could be <laughs> better than Sunil Gavaskar and uh, Alan Bodo had just started and uh, I used to look at uh, David Garr and uh, Sir uh, uh, Garfield Sobers, you know. I thought, well, if they can do it, I could do it too. But mind you, no. <laughs> well, it's an absolute, absolute honor to have a chat with you today. Um, please keep in touch and uh, we'll catch up again soon. Anytime, Anthony. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.